or evening to you wherever you are. And you're very welcome to this Britain Burma Society talk from Prospect Burma. We're going to take a couple of moments or so to get everybody in. There is around 120 people queuing to get in right now. There is a lot of love and interest for Burma going on in the room, and every single one of you is part of that interest. If you imagine this was a live talk and there's a foyer outside and it takes just a few minutes to get everybody through that door and through into the main hall, and everybody to get to their seats. So it's exactly the same in the digital world. There's only so much bandwidth. And so one by one, people will be coming into the room and starting to hear me probably halfway through a sentence and hoping that they haven't missed anything yet. And that's absolutely right. You haven't missed anything yet. Uh, you should be able to see our cute little children there just connecting through and probably our speakers in little boxes to the side. If you click, uh, and drag, you can actually move us around on your screen in those little boxes. You are in complete control. And I just to assure you, if you're new to these webinars, it's not like a Zoom talk where we're all talking to each other. I can assure you that absolutely nobody can see what you're doing. So if you're having lunch at the same time as this, then nobody is any the wiser. We'll begin in just a moment or so as we start to come together. Now, you, your box may have come to be a narrow box. You can basically full screen it and see absolutely everybody in it. I'll just make sure that you can see all of our speakers there. So if you've got a full screen, we're all there. Just to take you through the buttons at the bottom of the screen, essentially ignore them all except for the Q&A button. Uh, I'll give you a little bit more detail about of that in a moment. You will be able to ask questions, but do ignore the rest of those buttons. The other things to say is that uh, there are five of us you can see, we're all on separate internet connections, as is every single one of the 120 or so of you. At any point, anyone's internet could flick a bit. So if we freeze or if we sound like a robot or if it, we just glitch for a moment or so, then just hang, hang fire. And then after 10 to 20 seconds, it should write itself. If it doesn't, then you can always come back and get the way that you came in through the link in the first place. Also to be aware that we're all in different places, so we're seeing things at different speeds. So as we link between each other, there may be little gaps in what you see or pauses or talk over each other. We're all doing our best. We're all as new to this as you are. But anyway, you are very, very welcome. But if this was a Britain Burma Society live talk, of course, the first thing that we would have before we introduce everybody else is we'd have a formal welcome from the chair of the Britain Burma Society, May Thun La. So firstly, I'm going to hand over to you. Unmute. Uh, yeah, okay, unmute, sorry, that's I'm, the one. I'm, Thank you. Here we go. This is going to happen to all of us all the way through <laughs> and everyone's going to smile. Over to you. Good morning, everybody, both Prospect Burma members and uh, Britain Burma Society members, it's re really good to see you here this morning, afternoon or evening. Um, the two organisations are complementary and uh, we think that, you know, this is one of the reasons this talk today is going to be very interesting. Prospect Burma is here to tell us about their work, of course, and it'll be about their history and their plans for the future. Meanwhile, just, just a quick uh, reminder, this is the first of our low carbon footprint meetings for 2021 for our organization. We're 64 years old and we've just come into uh, the um, online era. Anyway, it's really great for to, to have you all attend. We've been, Britain Burma Society's been going 64 years and its aim is to set up, it's set up to foster friendship and understanding between British people and Burmese people, especially in exchanging cultural and social relations between the two countries. It always welcomes new members and information on joining you can find on our website, which if you just put Britain Burma Society, you'll get there. Um, basically, we've had no, that because of COVID, we've had no live meetings for almost a year, but we do have a virtual program 
Uh, we've got a few months in hand. We've got a few things to let, uh, come in the next few months. But right now, today, um, it's just to welcome Prospect Burma to, to tell us all about what they are and why they are and where they're going to go. Um, anyway, so back to you, Peter, if you'd like to sort of take over from this point. Thank you. It feels a bit like a Eurovision Song Contest or something, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, right. Uh, as you've seen, we've got lots of smiling uh, speakers to hear from. There they all are again. Give us a little wave, all our speakers. There we go. And the first one that we're going to go to is a man who has written and researched about Burma since the early 1980s for a variety of media and for academic and non-governmental organizations. He is one of the foremost experts, I'm sure, on Myanmar and Burma that we could actually wish to have on here. He's also one of the co-founders of Prospect Burma from its 1989 inception. I'm going to bring forward uh, Martin Smith. Hi, Martin. Hello, am I online now? Yep, you have the floor. Okay, right. Um, well, in these opening remarks, uh, I'd like to say a little bit about uh, Prospect Burma's history and its journey and how we got to the point where we are today. Um, in fact, I first spoke to Britain Burma Society in 1989 when we were just uh, becoming established. Um, and in some ways it seems a long time ago, but on the other hand, you know, although there's a lot of change in the world, it's a reminder of just how much there is still to do. And, uh, you know, around the world, the late 1980s were a time of great change and Burma was no exception. Uh, in many respects, Prospect Burma was born out of the events of those years. And it's that spirit of hope and opportunity, which was very strong in the late 80s, that continues to drive the organization today. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and illustrate this, I hope it will work with a few pictures uh, which will take you through um, uh, the history of Prospect Burma. And of course, we all can't travel much at the moment. So I hope by putting up some pictures, it brings both Britain and Burma into the um, focus today. So just give me a second while I do that. Okay, so I hope we're now uh, screen sharing. Um, as you'll remember, in 1988 marked a, a turning point in Burma's history. Uh, 10,000 students and democracy activists fell away uh, from the cities into the borderlands after protests which were brutally suppressed, uh, but it did bring to an end the military socialist government of General Ne Win. Um, unknown numbers of people died during that year. The universities remained closed for a long time and the future of young people looked very, very bleak. And it was in those very difficult circumstances that Prospect Burma began. Um, around the country's borders, there were dozens of camps, uh, China, England, India, Bangladesh, um, and um, India, um, where people had fled from the towns and they were now taking shelter. And some were to remain democracy activists, uh, some uh, took up arms and others uh, just try to continue their studies as best they could. Sorry. Um, so um, a picture on, um, on the uh, right, for example, is a group of students at Three Pagodas Pass, um, where hundreds of young people are gathered in early 1989. And the picture on the left is on the student refugee camp on the Tennyson River, uh, where some uh, medical students had set up a clinic. And as you could see from the picture, they brought memories of their colleagues and loved ones, uh, some of whom had died uh, during the previous year. Now, around the world, there were many people with great sympathy, but the question was, what could anybody do? Well, in, in the UK, at least, we were very lucky because we had a network of people who were very committed to, to Burma and knowledgeable, and many of them indeed were connected to the Britain Burma Society. And it was Michael Aris, Aung San Suu Kyi's husband, um, who made the connections which brought us all together. So this was the pre-internet age and I looked for some photographs for today and this was one of them I, I could find. Um, on the left is Lady Patricia Gore Booth. Um, I'm there with my wife and on our right is um, Evelyn Aris, who had just retired from the British Council 
and next to her is the Urawata Dhamma, uh, who is a Buddhist monk who became our first honorary patron, and he later became uh, a go-between in talks between Aung San Suu Kyi and the generals. Um, and uh, I should also say uh, Patricia Gore Booth had been Dorsu's guardian uh, when she studied in the UK. And there were other people with very deep knowledge of Burma. We were very lucky to have. Um, these included John Slim, I'm sure many of you know from the Burma Star Association, uh, Pat Herbert from the India Office Library, uh, Dorchichi May from the BBC Burmese Service, and of course, Martin Morland, who was ambassador during those turbulent times. And um, he, he, he later uh, became uh, chair. Now I mentioned people's backgrounds because it was very important in those days to get serious attention for education as a priority. I think a lot of people would think of student protests as just young radicals. And there were also people who thought, well, because these people seem to have a respectable background, that somehow there was some very elite or you know, lofty foreign office connection. Well, anybody who knows Prospect Burma knows that was actually very far from the truth. This was a remarkable group of young, uh, of, of older people, many of whom were in retirement, who came together out, out of commitment to do something. And remarkably, it was actually in River Meat Court by the River Thames, where both Evelyn and uh, Patricia lived, that we set up our first office. Um, and um, it's affectionately known as the dungeon, it was in a basement, and we stayed there for over the next 20 years. An enormous amount of work and endeavor went in in these rather humble premises. But I think that the key thing is that even at that stage, we had to make decisions and we made two which came to define our future. The first was that our realization that though our goal was to help the students, we could not disconnect from the challenges in the country at large. And that really meant acknowledging the state of suffering and civil war that existed in many of the places where the young students had arrived. It was actually people like the Karens and Mons who were giving shelter to the uh, students who'd arrived from the towns. So this, for example, on the left is a picture of a, a burnt out village in Karen state. And on the right is a picture I took a few days later of students who actually carried their uh, desks from that village into the forests. And as you can see, they were actually revising for their school exams, which they were just about to take. And one of the first expenditures we actually had to make was on two boats for students who were living in a very vulnerable area. And we realized if the students couldn't survive, well, how, how could we even think about their education? Uh, so if their camp came under attack, they, they could actually cross the border into Thailand. Uh, the second decision was more forward looking. And that came from our first chairman, Alan Hall, who'd been in Burma in the Second World War. And he wanted to give something back to the country. And it was Alan's idea to come up with the name of Prospect Burma. Um, and he didn't want something crisis driven like Burma aid or Burma emergency. It was agreed from the outset that we would not be an organization just doing emergency relief. Now, at the time, we never thought we would still be going 30 years later, but we, we had this slogan, keeping the flame of education alive, which we got from the students. And it allowed Prospect Burma to develop a very affirmative set of principles that would keep education at the forefront. And I would summarize these goals as equal opportunity for all, um, to help students in need wherever they are, and a, a commitment to use education for the benefit of the country. And it was from these core principles that Prospect Burma evolved, evolved over the following decades into the modernized organization is today. Now we were, and of course still are, a small charity, but we soon discovered that while um, there are many aid donors in the world and many generous people, education is not necessarily a field that attracts funds. This is for two main reasons. One is that it's often seen as expensive in regards to other fields. And the secondly, because impact, which is what donors like to see, can take time, indeed years, to really come through. But we never took that view. Uh, we, we saw, as in any country, education as a challenge for the long term. And in 88, after the Burmese way to socialism, the country, in many respects, the young people were starting at a kind of year zero in education. And at that time, UNESCO did a very important study on the country, which identified three key areas of failing in the country. Um, the, the first of one was the poor standards in high schools and universities. 
The second was the uh, lack of vocational training. And the third was uh, a complete collapse in the system. So just one in four children at that time actually finished the four years of primary school. Now we took those lessons to heart and in many ways our, our future ideas were, were shamed, uh, shaped around those principles. Um, so our, we actually had two main areas over the years and we still very much have that today. The first was uh, in this pattern of development was what I would call uh, vocational training, uh, such as English language uh, and other skills training. And from the outset, we were training young people who then became trainers. So they were very much our partners in these. So these are some very early photographs. Uh, one was actually um, teacher training programs to train teachers along the Thailand border. And they would go back into the country and then work in local schools. So on the left there is a picture of one of the 88 students, uh, Then Nine, uh, who was training local teachers in Kaya State. And on the right are some refugee children uh, in a village that had no electricity, but you can see them there studying uh, by night under uh, oil lamp. Um, but while with this was happening, we also expanded our scholarship program. Now to begin with, our priority was university students who were not able to finish their studies. And we, we, at that time, that was uh, literally tens of thousands of students. So um, we were able, with initial funding for this program from Dorsu's uh, Nobel Prize money, we were able to move on to an annual footing where we could target students and areas for study more carefully. And to date, we've actually provided over 2,400 students uh, with uh, scholarships, which I would say was one of the greatest of achievements of Prospect Burma to date, who've gone into such fields as health, law, human rights, and the media. And although progress was slow, actually, really from quite early on, people began to find different niches and ways in which they could work, including people who returned to the country. So uh, one of the early groups on the right there is the Meta Development Foundation. Uh, people approached us for, for scholarships and they went back to the country uh, where, where, where many of them then worked. And on the left is uh, Dr. A. Yu So, um, who is today head of programs of one of the largest health funds in the country, Access to Health. And um, such people um, really have been real pioneers uh, in, in, in changing the societal basis in, in, in the country by which education can be used. And parallel to our scholarship program, we have continued to support training programs with a special focus here on vulnerable communities which are hard to reach. And two in particular became long-standing projects over decades. Um, the first was the English language school in Delhi. And there was great ex excitement a few years back when Dorsu was actually able to visit them there. Uh, this was for refugee uh, people. Um, and on the right is the other, is the intensive English program to train teachers in Kachin state um, in a region that has been in and out of ceasefires. It's not a ceasefire area today, for example. And education, for young people in these areas has been a real opportunity for people who really had no other chances to, to study in a kind of modernized or international way learning skills for their future. Um, and some of our alumni um, and who are the key people in this are the uh, have gone on to develop, uh, develop significant programs of their own. Um, there's a long list, but I, I will only pick out two who, who are, of course, amongst the best known. Uh, the first is um, Dr. Then Nguyen on the right, um, who did a PhD here. He became a trustee of Prospect Burma, and he, he has initiated all kinds of groundbreaking projects in areas like uh, critical thinking and uh, migrant education. And on the left is uh, Dr. Sasser, who, who studied medicine abroad, went back to set up the Health and um, Hope charity in, one, in Chin State, in one of the most impoverished parts of the country. And the key thing about both of them is they picked on areas of neglect uh, when nobody was really thinking much about them. And, and now these issues are beginning to get serious attention in the country. So this is only a very brief outline of Prospect Burma's hin history. And in many aspects, a new chapter began after transition uh, with the country opening more up after 2011. Um, and it was a moment that many people have been waiting for. Um, it was, um, it meant a lot, a lot of hard thinking about our future and also, um, 
decisions about could we make a meaningful contribution in, in what ways? Well, actually, the answers were very quick and pretty easy. The first is obviously there's still great educational need. And we also realized through our alumni and the, so many people we've been working with that there was this enormous commitment amongst people themselves just to carry on with education. And, and this international connection could be very helpful. So, so Hannah will tell you about the current situation and the programs in the minute. Um, on the right is a, a workshop of Prospect Burma at its office in Yangon. And on the left is an alumni meeting. And I have to say, we were very fortunate when Hannah became executive director because she had the skill and determination to see through this very difficult period of trans transition that saw we, us develop um, new programs. And, and most importantly, the partnerships with Burmese people, our colleagues, who are now taking on many of the key responsibilities on the ground. So I would just end with two pictures taken in the past year. Uh, one of us, of our alumni, um, uh, Sam Mutu, who's engaged in building a, a, an environmental peace park in Karen State. And the other the very sad picture is uh, Kachin State. And this is of um, students taking their exams in the open air. Now, I, I showed at the beginning of displaced children doing this 30 years ago in Karen State. Well, this is uh, in Kachin State, where these are displaced children as well. And they're still sitting exams 30 years later in these displaced conditions. So um, they're living under conditions of insecurity and hardship, and this is Burma still today. So, so let's trust that peace and national reconciliation are achieve, achieved very much sooner rather than later in the uh, coming years. Um, the education uh, for all is a basic human right, and it still remains essential. So I will finish here, and I'll hand you back to uh, Peter. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you very much for the photographs as well as the talk. If any of you have any questions for Martin, uh, then please use the Q&A button. If I can just direct you to that, it's at the bottom of the screen. As I said, ignore the rest of the buttons, but that Q&A button, uh, if you press on it, you'll find a little white box appears. You can put a question into that. And then there's a little X at the top of that box to close the box again. Uh, so any questions for Martin or any of our other speakers, if you think of them throughout, then put them in early. But we will have a Q&A section at the end because we have two more speakers first. And the first of those, well, we've spoken quite a bit about um, about students and we talked about students but let's hear from a student uh, our next speaker is a scholar currently pursuing her phd in clinical psychology at the university of vermont in the united states of america she grew up in myanmar she's been studying and working in the us alone in the last 10 years thanks to support from various scholarships including prospect burmas so today we have with us to share her story on how she came to the US, how she became one of our scholars, what her studies focus on and her future plans. Uh, I'd like to hand you over next to uh, Pew Panu Chin. Hello, Panu. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Peter. Can you hear me OK? Yep. OK, great. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Today, I am excited to be here with you all virtually. It is an early morning here from the US, so good morning. So for my part of the presentation, I've been invited to mainly talk about my own life story, how to, um, and the experience of being a Prosper Grammar Scholar. So I would like to do that by briefly kind of talking about what I'm currently doing now, my academic brief story and my future plans and how the Prosop Burma has made it all possible in my journey. So as Peter mentioned, I am currently a third year PhD student at the University of Vermont here in the United States. And my current training includes three main areas, including research, clinical, and teaching in mental health. So for research, I am focusing on developing psychological resilience after traumatic experiences and developing culturally appropriate mental health services, um, especially for 
using in communities like Myanmar. This is because, as you may know, a lot of evidence-based mental health treatments has, have been developed um, from the Western-based philosophy and have been mostly tested in the Western-based patient population. So my interest is really to make these treatments more sensitively usable in areas like Myanmar. Clinically, you, my Panu. I'm just going to tip in there because I'm aware that everybody can see May next to you, I, I think, or most people can. She's popped up and we don't quite know why, but uh, we're, we're very happy to have her there next to you. We'll try and remove her if we can, um, but uh, please, please carry on speaking. Uh, Shall uh, I stop my video? Uh, yeah, why, why, why not? Then, then you, you don't have to keep a smile on the whole time. <laughs> over, over, over to you, Panu. Please, please carry on. <laughs> it's worth having my name stuck there. <laughs> okay, we'll look at you as well. <laughs> it says ex- from Victoria Bowman to all panelists because you have spotlighted me. Uh, somebody yes, somebody has spotlighted me. Mm-hmm. Trying to remove that spotlight from me. Ah, there we go. No, we have found it. Thank you, uh, Victoria. You've absolutely found the right button for me. I'm glad you know what you're doing. <laughs> this is brilliant. Thank you. Uh, I'll just uh, put that. Should be Pano for everybody now. Oh, that's Vicky. Cool. Thank, thank you, Vicky. <laughs> We're up and running now. Sorry, Panu, back to you. No problem. Everybody um, else on mute. If that's how you know, Zoom is. So, um, no problem. So, what I was kind of talking about is my current study, studying what the research experiences and the next two components of my areas are in the clinical and teaching. So, clinically, what I get to do in my current training is working in a psychological clinic to deliver evidence-based mental health services for both children and adults here um, in Vermont. And my favorite part of this clinical experience is that I get to participate in this specialty service called the Connecting Cultures Program, which serves refugees and uh, immigrants communities here in Vermont. So as some of you may know, Vermont State in the US itself is not very culturally diverse, but I'm fortunate that I get to work in that specialty service. So that means I get to really work with um, patients from different cultural backgrounds, some even from Myanmar. So getting to work with patients from my own communities have been amazing and other patients with similar cultural backgrounds such as from Nepal, Bhutan, or from other parts of the world such as um, Somalia or Kenya. So this has been really meaningful to me because um, in my future after my studies, my hope is to go back home and to deliver mental health services for different um, ethnic minorities back home and really all who need mental health services or being learning how to adapt mental health services flexibly to meet the unique needs of clients and patients have been incredibly valuable for me. So the third part of my training is in teaching in higher education. So as a PhD student, I get to teach um, as a teaching assistant as well as an independent instructor for both undergraduate and graduate um, classes. And you know, as a person, I have always enjoyed teaching. So I love that experience, but also thinking about my future again, I am interested in disseminating these evidence-based mental health services. So that meant um, I would love, I would need to, and would like to um, train other students and mental health professionals um, to disseminate these services. So getting to develop different teaching strategies and skills have been also um, incredibly valuable. So basically what I'm currently doing in my program feels like a dream career to me, whether I'm doing clinical work, doing research or teaching, and all of this have been only made possible thanks to the support from the Prospect Burma. Because looking back in about 10 years ago, that's when I first came to the United States. Um, I was about 17 years old at that time, and I was coming here on an exchange scholarship just for six months. I was a first year medical student at the time and this program from the US embassy allowed first year um, university students from Myanmar to visit the United States. So during that experience, it was a completely eye-opening experience to me, although I was just an exchange scholar, I was able to work in different research laboratories, biology lab, chemistry lab, and seeing how students at the US um, universities learn, um, such as you know, asking questions in classes, using critical thinking, which is different from how we learn back home. And so I, you know, I was really inspired, but also thought about how, dreamed about how I wanted to kind of pursue my father's studies in the United States. But at that point, it felt 
sort of next to impossible coming from a low income family. And so I just returned home after six months and you know basically told my father all about my experiences and you know the the part about um the scientific methods at the u.s universities as well as the ability to ask questions to challenge yourself and in your field is what really inspired me because as you know growing up under the former um dictatorship like students younger students like us were not encouraged to ask questions in general, not just in classes, just in general in life. So um, that sort of education opportunities were incredibly exciting to me, but um, I was sort of lost about what to do since, you know, scholarship opportunities are extremely rare uh, for Burmese students. So here I would like to quickly uh, talk about how my personal and academic journey has been uh, inspired by my father who I've been talking about uh, at the point how I wanted to go back to the United States. And so my father is actually a former political prisoner who was in prison for seven years for his activism against the former dictator. And so, you know, despite such hardships, my father is also one of the most resilient and happiest people that you will ever meet. And so since growing up, you know, I learned from him not to easily give up sort of in the face of um, adversities or in the face of hardships and how to make different problems of your life into either opportunities or meaningful experiences you know that's what he did in his best capacity so at that point my father you know when i talked about that kind of uh, inspirations i hope to go back to the united states he talk about okay financially must be would be really really uh, difficult and almost impossible for a family but if you really want to we should not give up and we should look into opportunities and so i remember you know back then my father would take me to like we would take late night buses to go to the small internet cafe and read it about different scholarship possibilities you know at the time this was about 10 years ago it was incredibly slow internet so if to get to like google homepage, like you would wait and wait for like six minutes so and we're thinking about you know how yeah like when i finally found professor Brummer, how it changed everything as saying wow this might be a possibility you know although it professor bummer does not cover full scholarship for students it can provide um, incredible support and open um, doors for students applying other scholarships so long story short i gave my very best job you know several nights of spending at the small internet cafe writing about scholarship uh, improving my essays and um you know my sort of dreams became reality when i hear back from professor bummer that part of my undergraduate um, talk will be, undergraduate tuition will be covered by the prospect Burmer. And that, uh, incredible was, in, that was incredible because um, having had that support opened many other doors for me, being able to apply to other scholarships such as the Open Society Foundations and um, other biomedical programs through my universities and internationally. And so basically, you know, if yeah looking back it felt like a miracle but like it was not an easy journey years after years of you know reapplying and getting that uh, amazing support from professor Obama, i was able to graduate um from montana state universities in neuroscience um in neurobiology and neuroscience in 2015. so after that i then moved to boston and became really interested in mental health um that's when i started working at uh, mclean harvard teaching hospital where I got to learn about uh, mental health treatment firsthand um, at the inpatient unit. And that's when I became really inspired to pursue my father's studies in mental health, because as you all know, you know, being under the 50 years of dictatorship have traumatized our communities in many different ways. And we, you know, are in urgent need of mental health services, but the resources are incredibly rare. And at the time when I was working in Boston, I was also reading reports, you know, for example, from the World Health Organization. I learned that um, in about 2016 in Myanmar, there are only seven clinical psychologists. No, there are only four clinical psychologists at the doctorate level for 55 million people. I'll talk about the gap. And so I thought about I want to be the fifth, you know, clinical psychologist. And I uh, thought about what to do. So like kind of um, exploring all the graduate studies. And again, Professor Romer has made possible for me to pursue this higher education because um, although my current studies are covered, um, 
for tuition by PhD um, funding by the university. You know, since the United States is incredibly expensive, like I still need the support to pay for my living expenses. And without Professor Romer, I would not have been able to pursue. So all of the, you know, life experiences and inspirations of my life brought me to where I'm today. And, you know, just last night when I'm thinking about um, this story sharing, I got reminded of how sort of my own community, especially my father and many others back home taught me about human resilience since I was a child. And now I get to study resilience scientifically to further develop mental health services. And I'm really looking forward to returning home, working as a mental clinician, as well as uh, becoming a professor and develop, um, sharing and disseminating all of these mental health treatments. And, you know, basically I also want to really highlight that my story is just one of the many, many stories of students that Professor Bremer have impacted and made a difference. And if you think about it, it's not just one um, student's life since it's create you know, many positive ripple effects. Um, so my story offers hope and inspirations or possibilities to other students in my community, especially from low resource uh, families who are interested in pursuing higher education or studying abroad. And I also know that, you know, both my colleagues and friends from Professor Obama, uh, when, we, when we're done with our studies, when we get to return home, uh, you know, many of us are working um, as professionals, researchers, teachers, change makers, as Martin said, in different sectors of Myanmar. So, you know, I just wanted to highlight how it's true that investment in education is really the foundation um, to create all of the transformations in Myanmar and for Myanmar's future. So I'm forever grateful for all of the support from the Professor Obama and for anybody in the audience who's interested in, who are students, uh, talk to me uh, either now or later. I'm happy to share. Uh, about my experiences and also wanted to thank everybody from Professor Bomber as well as from the British Bomber Society who I know has been inv investing in Myanmar young people and Myanmar's um, education. I'm thinking about especially in the current pandemic times um, in the face of a lot of adversities and uncertainties you know, education is going to help us recover and move our country, continue to forward. So thanks for continuing to support in, um, education of Myanmar. And thank you for your attention today. I welcome any questions you have, uh, um, either from the students or anybody. Lovely. Thank you very much, Panu, and thank you for talking so eloquently to lots of people around the world. Uh, very, very impressive. I'll just take the spotlight off you for a moment. And there is everybody still here for you, including May still there. Thank you for that. And apologies uh, for the little glitch there. Uh, I hope everybody's internet is holding fire. From what I can see, it's uh, there's been a couple of robot moments, but actually it's been pretty good, which uh, for most of you are watching from the United Kingdom, where we've got uh, quite a heavy storm. So radio signals will be affected today. But I think we're doing pretty pretty well well you've you've heard the history and the context of uh what we're talking about with prospect burner you've heard from panu as well the q a button is there at the bottom uh so do click on that and add to those questions we'll have a q a session at the end uh, some of you in the chat as well feel free to have a chat uh, you clearly know how that works uh, and vicky bowman some of you may well know uh, is already helping to answer one or two questions there as well uh, so do get involved uh but uh we'll head for a q a and, and open it up to all the speakers and a few moments but the, the final thing is to see well what where are we going next where is prospect burma going next and the lady of course who knows all about that is the person operationally running it prospect burma's executive director hannah marcazzo um thanks pete um thank you so much um may and the britain burma society for hosting this event we actually originally started talking about um, a Britain Burma Society Prospect Burma event, um, probably this time last year. We scheduled it um, for April 2020, um, that got moved to June 2020. Um, and I had hoped to be able to do this presentation face to face. Um, sadly, it's not to be. So um, now, January 2021, we're finally able to. Um, to spend time talking about um, the work of Prospect Burma um, to, to, to the British Burma Society members. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, as Pete said, I'd like to uh, follow on from uh, Martin's talk um, to just bring you up 
to, to date with present day Prospect Burma. Um, and I've got a presentation I'd like to share with you. So just bear with me one second. Okay, um, so yeah, as, as um, Martin alluded to as well, I've, I've always thought that uh, Prospect Burma's organizational changes and adaptations have, have mirrored those and the progress of, of the country of, of Myanmar. Um, and over the last few years, that, that those changes have been happening quite rapidly. Um, our belief, however, um, that education is the way that is, is going to cause transformation in the country has not changed from our beginnings, nor has our um, intention to focus on the most vulnerable communities um, within the country now that we can. Um, previously, we had been focused on, on vulnerable um, communities from Myanmar um, outside of the country. Um, so for many years, we, we were operating outside of, Burma, Myanmar. Um, we were providing scholarships to enable students to study at universities. Um, we were supporting other projects and programs outside of the country. Um, the change for us came when the country opened up um, and we were able to open an office in Myanmar in 2016. When we, when we opened the office, it really opened the doors for us to be able to start asking questions about our programs. Um, and the, the first question that we started asking were, what are the barriers to accessing higher education abroad? If we really want to focus on providing higher educational opportunities to students from very vulnerable communities, um, what is preventing those students being able to access that higher education? Um, and we identified a number of, of different barriers um, that, that people from vulnerable or underserved communities within Myanmar face when they're even thinking about accessing higher education abroad. So English language, critical thinking and digital literacy, literacy skills. These are all really important components of being able to not just study abroad, but being able to thrive in a, in a university setting um, in, in, a, in a high quality institution abroad. Um, another barrier is information. How do you even find out what universities exist? How do you know what studies to choose? How do you start applying for those? Um, and, and there's a there's a massive barrier as well, which is financial, the, not just um, your geographic location, your access to um, English language courses, which cost money, but the cost of um, obtaining a qualification that will enable you uh, to get to into university. Um, so we started looking at all of these barriers asking the question who's receiving Prospect Burma scholarships and more importantly, who isn't receiving Prospect Burma scholarships and how can we help those people um, to, uh, to access higher education abroad. Um, and that's when access to, that, that's when our program access to learning um, was, was developed. Um, access to learning is um, a series of projects that facilitates English language learning, critical thinking skills, um, and provide the qualifications needed. So breaking down some of those barriers, and, and we target our access to learning programs at different um, underserved communities within Myanmar. Um, these two photos illustrate two of our projects that we've got going on. On the left um, is Sky Age, which is a residential basic English language program. Um, and on, on the right hand side is our, our bridging program. So that's, that's run by Prospect Burma and that's to provide um, young people from different states and regions with um, the IELTS qualifications that they need to um, apply successfully to universities abroad. Um, 
underpinning our access to learning programs is the facilitation of cross-cultural exchange, bringing together young people from diverse ethnicities and regions to learn, live, study and converse together, um, building lifelong bonds and understanding across national divides. So another question that we started to ask when we opened our office in Myanmar was, well, we have all of these amazing students that are, that are obtaining a scholarship. Uh, we, we give around, uh, historically we've given around 90 scholarships a year to students to study in different countries around the world. Um, and we're seeing now um, about 75% or over of those returning to Myanmar. Um, but what happens next? What happens to those, those students? Um, and how are they able to access or are they able to access support that um, they need to fulfill their own potential, um, but also to, to join with other alumni across Myanmar to, to perhaps even strengthen the, the impact of, of an, a group of educated together, um, people working together to make um, positive changes within communities. Um, and having asked that question, we then developed our um, Change in the Community program. Um, and this is, this is really quite new for us as an organization. Um, so over the past few, couple of years, we facilitated networking events for alumni in Myanmar. Um, and most recently, and, and really most excitingly, um, we have launched our alumni regional cluster hubs. Um, the first one, um, the acronym is ARCH. Um, the first one was launched in Yangon only 12 months ago. Um, and during the past 12 months, the ARCH has been more successful than we'd even thought at the beginning. Um, they've worked together during this pandemic um, to fundraise, to buy food um, and PPE and to deliver money as well to families and communities within Yangon that, that desperately need this type of support at this time. Um, so the photos that I've got here um, are showing uh, food distribution um, and information sharing about COVID-19 and, and the protections that, that can be put in place. Um, those people that you see wearing masks, those are all Prospect Burma alumni um, that have been working together on this, this community project. I should say that prior to um, us uh, launching the arch these people didn't know each other so it's it's been a way for them to connect network together and, and share their skills um, so I just wanted to, to share this diagram with you um, because this represents now what Prospect Burma is doing um, and is looking to develop and enhance more in the future so this is what we call our stepping stones diagram um, and it's intended to illustrate um, the journey of a young person from a vulnerable or underserved community um, and the different steps that they need to take to obtain a higher education abroad um, and return to Myanmar and give back to their community. Um, and, and in each step along this journey of higher education, Prospect Burma is, is seeking to support those students. So right at the beginning, we talked about our access to learning program where we're supporting basic English, intermediate English and advanced English and the English language certification um, underpinned by critical thinking, intercultural exchange and also um, knowledge and information sharing in the form of um, career counselling and helping choose university subjects to understand what scholarships are available. Um, we then have our, our sort of flag, flagship program, which I haven't spoken much about today, which is um, our, our scholarships, supporting students um, as they attend university, setting up mentoring with them to help support them during their studies, um, to help their career development post-graduation, to look at perhaps supporting them as we have with PANU um, through our uh, postgraduate degree. Um, and then, moving on to, towards the end of their journey to reintegrating back into the country to 
to participating in alumni led projects and to supporting the next generation of students to come through this educational journey. Um, so this is what this is our focus as an organization. This is what we're doing. Um, it wouldn't be a presentation remotely in January in lockdown if, if we didn't um, talk about um, COVID-19. Um, and as for all of you, COVID has um, made this past year an in incredibly challenging year. Um, it's had its ups and it, its downs. Um, it certainly hasn't been boring. Um, the, the direct impact of, of the pandemic for us has meant that some of our face to face teaching is on hold. Um, so some of our in country access to learning programs um, have been put on hold or delayed. Um, the good news is that university students continue their courses, albeit online, um, and we've been able to uh, undertake our um, scholarships ap application process with, with very little change. Um, we've seen our alumni in the in-country step up um, to really support their communities, so that's a, that's a brilliant thing. Um, as with so many organisations worldwide, we've experienced a, a drop in income. Um, but despite this, we've been looking on how we can innovate, how we can continue to support education to those who most need it within, within Myanmar and within their communities. Um, and so we've brought some of our access to learning programmes online. Um, and so we're now bringing English language courses um, especially in Rakhine State actually, um, to different communities via their smartphones. And, and that's, that's an amazing achievement, I would say. It's not something that we thought we would do this time last year. Um, so that's it for me. Um, thank you so much for your time, for joining this webinar today. Um, thank you again to, to the Britain Burma Society for, for hosting us. Um, please uh, drop us a line with any questions and I'd like to just hand back to Pete now. Thank you very much Hannah and any questions for Hannah or for Panu or for May or for Martin then do go to the bottom of your screen the Q&A is there so put some questions in there's some up there already uh, or alternatively you can use the chat obviously some of you are uh, technically aware and are using that already and answering already people's questions, which is brilliant. So that means that uh, there are people getting involved, not just us. So we're basically going to make it informal from now on. Um, we're going to start actually uh, by referring to May. If you, if you can un un uh, mute yourself for a moment, you, you've been hearing a lot about what Prospect Burma has been doing, but I I'm sure uh, you, you can think of some parallels of the work that Britain Burma Society has been doing and also uh, other projects that you might be involved with. Well, Britain Burma exists to serve, or has existed to serve people here in, in Britain. So, uh, and in the nature of our membership, individual members have, in, have projects or charities or whatever they're supporting in Burma, but the, the organization as a whole, as far as I'm aware, um, and I ought to be aware, isn't, um, engage in any particular um, project. We're more about fostering friendship and relationship between the countries. And here, in, for example, we fostered a relationship uh, fairly successfully with the Burmese embassy. So there's a little bit of toing and froing going on. Myself personally, uh, my husband and I run a charity called Helping the Burmese Delta. So it's very interesting looking at all the things that Hannah's doing, because if you like, we're at the bit before her, her, her graduated step, before the bit about learning English. We're actually trying to get children educated to a ninth and 10th standard, which is equivalent of GCSEs, I suppose. We're, we're doing that out in the country where, never mind going overseas, they haven't even got any local access in many areas, you know, villages without proper schools or whatever so there's a lot of work going on by lots of people all over the place i know members of the, the our organization are engaged in projects but there are very many and uh, they'll probably speak for themselves um, it may come up in the chat or the question and answers bit 
OK, thank you very much. Uh, going to the questions, uh, I know uh, Panu Chin is already busy hard away. You see, younger people are so much technically better, aren't they, <laughs> working on those Q&A. Uh, but I'll also put them to, to the panel. The first one uh, from San Sanu, thank you, uh, asking if uh, you have by any chance had experience dealing with child abuse victims during your study uh, because Burma's just had a child rights law in January 2020 and it's a, a very undeserved area, uh, it's an underserved area. Uh, any experience there, Panu? Yes. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Peter. And thank you so much for the question, um, Dr. Sen San Wu. Uh, I am definitely interested in that area and like so incredibly needed globally, especially back home um, in Myanmar. So I um, have been gaining some experiences in working with um, children with different types of trauma and abuse. And um, since my research also focused on resilience during development, meaning despite having experienced such um, traumatic experience, how to help children grow, grow up with, you know, psychological resilience. Um, so I'm definitely interested. I have some, gaining some experience and hope to gain further experiences in that area. And so after my studies, we were just chatting. And so right now, how I would love to stay connected um, with Dr. Sun Sun, as well as anybody who is interested because that's um, really, um, an important area, especially in all, um, you know, all parts globally. Um, but also, I think it's important to train um, all like professionals to work um, in trauma informed manner when you work with children who have been impacted by such horrible experiences. So definitely interested. Um, yes, after my studies, please let's get in touch. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Winston Sald uh, Saldana has uh, put a question in. Have you done in, an investigation inside the country that there are still educated people who can help out, help out in the reform of education in Myanmar? These people have been trained abroad, that studied and worked abroad, and then come back, uh, and those people need to be approached. Uh, I'll put that one to Martin, actually. Um, so, so because historically over the over the years, uh, pre presumably it's not just people who've been through the prospect Burma process, but uh, you, you've been out investigating, trying to find who can help where, I guess. I'll have to take you off mute. There we go. Yes, um, it's, it's um, I'm not sure I completely understand the question because obviously people are doing all kinds of things whatever their personal experiences are, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to relate to Prospect Burma in any shape or form. You know, very much this was just to give an opportunity and also to keep the education debate alive. And I think that there are one or two other questions here which I probably will answer in the same way. I think the biggest problem is that the, we're, we're hearing about other university partnerships and so on. There are a plethora of things that are happening. And I think if it hadn't been for COVID, we'd have seen a lot of these things accelerating. So, so what I'm going to say is, is more an answer that the problem, I don't think, is actually within so much the individuals or the communities or, or, or um, the, the, the lack of commitment from, from people who are studying, who are involved in education. I think a bigger problem that anybody who's interacting with the country is finding is, is the state education. It's the state of education and it's actually the government education. Uh, and I have spoken to people who are involved in educational reform. And in a way they're trying to play catch up for so many years of neglect. You know, there's a bureaucracy, there's a, there's a failing in standards and it's very difficult if you've got problems in the primary schools which then go into the high schools, then go into the universities. You can't just suddenly press a button in one place and see not only reform, but actually see educational outcomes. So, so you've got a problem that university standards still need to, to upgrade, not only in the teaching, but also in terms of access and, and, and you know, the, um, the kind of people who can get into universities. So I, I think this, this is one of the most sensitive issues. And um, there's, a, there's just been an election, there's a new government coming in. Um, I think the last five years for many people have been disappointment because people hoped with a, with a democratically elected government that the floodgates would open to innovative change. Well, it, it hasn't quite happened like that in many sectors, but I think many of the questions we're getting are dealing with how can people make a contribution? And I'd say actually the state education system also has to reform for all these uh, advantages and changes and dynamics to really pick up. 
It's a point that William Crawley has made uh, specifically in relation to Burmese medical education. Uh, it's been, been difficult to maintain the quality in the 80s and 90s as up-to-date medical textbooks ceased to be available to Burmese students. Uh, as Prospect Burma contributed to rebuilding uh, medical educational standards in Myanmar. Uh, and John Bassendine, Bassendine, Bassendine uh, has also asked what mental health services are available in Burma. I, I think I'll start with Hannah for um, for what medical uh, scholarships and, and support that Prospect Burma are giving at the moment. Uh, and then we'll move on to mental health services, whoever knows best for that one, to be honest. Hannah. Um, yes, thank, thanks for the question. Um, as I understand it, the question is about um, supporting the development of curricula inside of Myanmar rather than externally. Um, and curriculum development is, isn't really an area that we get into anyway. Um, but Prospect Burma as an organisation is, is really focused on higher education abroad. So it's, it's recognising that um, we're a small organisation. We can't, um, we don't have the, um, the bandwidth to work with institutions to change the way that they teach. Um, and so we, we're taking young people um, to educational institutions that do provide that quality of, um, of and level of education um, so that they can come back and bring that to the country. I think the other thing that, that we, we're really keen on doing as well is, um, again, building up um, institutional knowledge through scholarships. So looking at providing scholarships to, to people like Panu who are doing um, research um, and understanding those sorts of methodologies so that they can then come back and, and bring those expertise to um, different uh, university departments um, as, an, as and where they fall. But, but we don't directly work with, with higher educational institutes within Myanmar. Uh, and as for what mental health services are available, uh, Panu, uh, earlier you mentioned a lack of clinical psychologists, uh, so pr probably best for you. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, this is um, based on my own sort of like research and reading about Myanmar services. Um, so what we do have is some psychiatrists working um, to immediately help, you know, individuals with most sort of urgent and severe mental health um, conditions. And we have um, two major public hospitals for mental health in Yangon and in Mandalay. And I think like recently they also started to have like some more private um, sector in treating more severe substance use problems and severe mental health problems. What we are still limited in is that trauma informed mental health programs, as well as um, you know, really treating, they actually over 150 plus mental health programs, problems or diagnoses that we need help with. And I think um, the services are just extreme, extremely limited. And, um, and then but what is encouraging is though, um, I'm starting to see, especially during the COVID pandemic times, I think like the stigma related to mental health, uh, people are at least having conversations, how to share mental health knowledge and like a lot of, um, I think private uh, in the private sector, there are some mental health professionals starting to have their psychological clinic. So that's exciting. Um, so just hopeful to develop more and more, you know, both professionals and mental health knowledge and awareness. Like I, you know, that's why I think we need teachers in that area to really um, both develop research program as well as share uh, both mental health awareness and education for both families and individuals and providers, uh, how mental health problems can be treat it effectively, develop resilience, and not a thing to be scared of. Mm -hmm. Does that uh, answer your question? Yeah. Uh, yep. And in fact, our, our first question was whether Prospect Burma has any engagement in the, the education of children and students with disabilities, which can, of course, be mental and physical. Uh, probably one for, for Martin uh, over the years. Has Prospect has Burma had uh, students with disabilities? Um, yes. I, uh... I don't think specifically so. I think um, one of the sort of oddities uh, about the educational system in Myanmar is that within the medical establishment, there's a very high knowledge of education and expertise because of the way the exams go, that there's still been quite a high level of training, um, but it, it's, it's very much an elite. And then what happens 
is that a there is not a rollout of health from from that medical capacity and secondly there is um, a lack of um, outreach to people with specific needs uh, like mental health issues or disability mm. and, and deafness specifically has been brought up yes here. All, all of these kind of things there, there, there are sort of there have always been schools and institutions dealing with this and there have been NGOs for example who, who work very heavily on landmine victims so so in areas where those NGOs have had access there's been a lot of help for uh, prosthetic limbs and uh, rehabilitation and things like that but that is very sort of um, spasmodic you, you couldn't say it's systematic and I, I think one of the key things about the work Banu is doing I, I actually had an experience this is over 15 years ago I was approached to do a, a, a multinational project about trauma in different countries. And I actually spent looking at six months uh, talking to different medical people in the country about how to deal with trauma. And all I can say is that at that stage, I'm sure there were people with knowledge, but these were slightly taboo issues. And what I ran into was a kind of sense amongst the medical profession and, and families that if you didn't suffer some kind of trauma, there was something wrong with you. So many people, as we heard from Panu from her own family, they were living with their own traumas. And it was very difficult for somebody to, um, to, to sort of stand out and say, well, look at me, I need help. So there were people living in great conditions of distress. And I'm, I'm sure that's still the same, but it's, it's, a, it's very much a neglected area, absolutely. Uh, moving the subject on slightly, but while I've got you, Martin, uh, Richard Dolan uh, has a question about the types of students applying for scholarships during the transition uh, and in recent years are they different in terms of ethnicity compared to a few years ago for example does it remain predominantly ethnic nationality applicants from conflict and conflict affected areas uh, and if so which ones uh, and it might be you or it might be hannah well i, I can make a, a, a generalized statement is that our applications, although you know, we, we don't have a kind of quota system or any notion like that, every, every application is looked at individually, very often related to need and subject. Uh, they would be key, key criteria. And I, I, I wouldn't say, you know, Hannah might, might know otherwise, but I, I don't think over all these years, there's been any significant change in the pattern. And um, we were never necessarily a majority for ethnic minority peoples. It actually happens that at least a third of the population is ethnic nationality. So that will be a very high number. Um, I would say that we, we've very often had a preponderance of people who had uh, regional connections, let's say to Thailand and India in particular, to a lesser extent, China and Bangladesh. So, so students who had access like Chin or Karen, uh, Shan and so on, who, who came through those borderlands, would, would probably know more about us than other people. But I, I wouldn't say there's been any huge change at all. Um, yeah, so just to, to agree with um, Martin, I wouldn't say that there's been a change in ethnicity. I think we are restricted by where we can uh, um, send our message and advertise our work. Um, and so it's about who knows us. Um, and so that, that's really where we're seeing um, different applicants come from is who, who knows us, who knows about um, our work, who is has who knows someone that's had a PB scholarship, though those seem to be the people that apply. Um, what I would say has changed over the years is the focus on priority subjects. Um, so every year we look at the the subjects um, and we, we have a discussion with different stakeholders. Uh, we look at priority subjects for scholarships. Um, and those are related to the needs of the country. And as, as, as we see the needs of the country, um, probably more clearly now than, than we did five or 10 years ago, our priority subjects have changed to reflect that. And actually some of that comes down to um, some of the really boring stuff or, or unseen stuff like infrastructure and, um, you know, how, how, do you, how do you build roads? How do you build bridges? How do you, um, and economics and, and public policy. And those were subjects that we, we perhaps wouldn't have um, prioritized previously. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Uh, between the Q&A and the chat, I'll just need to direct people that on the chat, there are discussions happening and the likes of Vicky Bowman and, uh, and, and Panu are 
answering questions as we go along, which is absolutely fab. Thank you. If you there's plenty of information going on there, so do check out the chat function. Uh, we'll probably go for uh, we've been over an hour now, so we'll probably take it to a quarter past two, uh, roughly, uh, and finish off the Q and A side of questions. Uh, there's one come in. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm afraid that the admin name has come up on some of these questions rather than people's names. So apologies for that. But the question is with regards to pre-university support in particular admissions and mentoring, uh, has Prostate Beck Burma been able to use the expertise at international schools in Myanmar? There's plenty of teachers there who could volunteer if needed. Uh, Hannah. Um, yes, thanks. Uh, no, is the short answer. Um, the longer answer is that sounds absolutely brilliant. Um, again, it, it, it comes back to us being quite, you know, a really quite a small organisation. We've got a staff of four in country. Um, so um, if there are ways in which we can connect with, with these expertise, I think we'd be really grateful to be put in touch with them and then we can take those connections forwards. Um, at the moment, generally mentoring and support is uh, we, it's peer to peer, so student to student and alumni to uh, graduates. Thank you. I think the questions over on the chat side of things are, are actually all answering themselves with lots and lots of information and links and names and email addresses. Uh, and this is wonderful that uh, we've basically joined together Prospect Burma people and Britain Burma Society people. And there is a great sharing of information, which is absolutely wonderful. Uh, I'm going to then add the last question myself, which is in these COVID times, uh, what is the difference in situation give us a flavor obviously none of us have been able to go to Myanmar for quite a while so give us a flavor of how COVID is affecting the educational landscape there and maybe what needs to be done and how education can help get through it uh, and while you do that I'll also flick up a few pictures of the alumni delivering supplies to to local villages too uh, Hannah I think again for that first uh, but Martin please uh, chip in if you want so I was actually going to direct that to Martin first off. <laughs> okay, straight to Martin then. <laughs> Sorry, Martin. Um, yeah, it, it, funny enough, this, this, this is such a strange thing. I mean, look at Zoom and how we're all interconnecting with Britain and Burma. You know, after 60 years, we're using this technology. And I think what's running through our theme of discussions, but also our experiences, how the internet age has coincided with... Um, uh, not only COVID, but change in Burma. And, and we, you literally have the situation in the country where villagers who often were pretty illiterate, the first thing they get is a mobile phone. So, so the degree of access to, to, the, to the world has been enormous. And I think um, without the internet, the whole world would have suffered uh, greatly during COVID, the, the exchanges that people can have. So for those people who are sort of engaged, who, who, who's seeking education, uh, the internet has been a, a lifeline. I think Vicky has mentioned in the, um, Vicky Bowman in, in, on the side, how Arakan, Rakhine State, there, there are areas uh, where uh, the internet has, has been sort of either turned off or turned down to a different speed. But, but generally, yes, you know, it has been a kind of strange experience. I think the Burma, like all of us, is going to emerge very differently from this experience. And, and I think internet connection, internet teaching, communications are, are going to remain something. So I, I would say that that's been a positive. The COVID experience, of course, has been, well, let, let's face it, it has been a disaster. Um, even with all the education online in the world, the experiences that people have to go through in isolation, uh, knowing about illness with sufferings with other people, what's happening in their communities, we, we shouldn't underestimate that either. So I, I think, you know, that there, there might be some positives in communication which come out of this, but we can't underestimate the damage this has done to, to a generation who are really a generation still seeking to emerge. Thank you, Martin. Uh, we'll start our wrapping up proceedings there. Then firstly, with thanks from myself as the administrator to uh, to Hannah, to Martin, to Pew Panu Chin and to May Tha La for uh, all your words and wise wisdom today. Thank you to everybody who has taken part and also especially those who have given information, got involved in the chat and given a lot and lot of shared information between two wonderful organisations. However, for a Britain Burma Society talk, it, the way to finish it, I gather is actually samosas. Uh, there aren't any today, but uh, the, the best way to finish is to go back to me, Tha La, if I can uh, ask you to unmute, uh, and we'll finish with yourself, and then there'll be a closing screen. So I'll leave the last words to you uh, to finish everybody off on exactly the feel that they want before they go back to work or their afternoon nap, depending on where they're at. 
Well, first of all, we start with samosas and coffee. This is the essential thing. Um, secondly, I did forget to do something we'd agreed we'd do at the beginning of our talk. We wanted to let you all go off in a big high, you know, feel good about what's going on in Burma. But actually, I just needed to make uh, make an announcement of uh, uh, three three deaths that not the whole of the membership, either of Prospect Burma or or Britain Burma Society. Some of, I think there'll be people who know these people. We've had just this week announced that the death of Su Fen, who had gone to hospital for a heart operation and caught COVID there, but got better and ended up dying peacefully at home. We also have Dr. Dime E, one of our council members. Her husband, Dr. Thetun, has died from COVID. And the third death is an older one. Our treasurer, Keith Wynn, uh, passed away last in the autumn in, and his funeral was in October. I wanted to make a formal thing of it, but never really found the moment to do so. So I just thought, just so that everybody knows that these people have gone now. Um, on the more bright side, just to then go away from death and get happy again, um, this thing about education in Burma and uh, internet and so on, everybody is doing all sorts of things as best as they can in Burma. All, all our people, people we know, everyone is trying to help in their own ways, uh, whether it's in terms of PPE and sanitation or teaching children or in our, our headmasters devise some kind of plan where they'd work at home and bring send their work to our school once a week and you know our teachers are reconvened for those moments and so on there are things happening but we must all be aware i think i think i'm still i'm not wrong things haven't really changed in that you do not mess with the burmese education uh, system or how they choose to teach you cannot mess with that in burma it's one of those things you know it's like that with medicine as well you have to go, you have to toe the line and teach according to how they want to teach. So anything we do is extra to the basic way that the curriculum works there. We cannot alter their curriculum, but we can enrich and we can supplement. And that's all we have the scope to do. If you go beyond that, you get into trouble. We've worked our way through a load of trouble. and We've understood now there is nothing you can do to say our education is better or an advancement on the way it's been going, how about it? And the internet, but the point about internet has all been scrolling on in the um, questions area, but internet is fantastic for helping our students, but it's just really not everywhere, really, really not. So on another day, on another occasion, again, it's in the chat, but if you contact I'm also a trustee in eDegato, which is a little organization here doing stuff in Burma. Our work with eDegato is to give access to students who need online access, who want to do some homework or, or what, homework's a bit of a uh, project or whatever. They, they can act, it's to give access to online where online isn't possible, where the internet isn't broadly available. So we've got a, a sort of way of providing Wi-Fi and access to information to do with studies. Um, and that's a whole nother way of, you know, helping the Burmese. But you cannot, you can't, you just got to be so cautious, as Hannah obviously knows. You know, you've got to be very cautious about how you present what you do to the Burmese system. Not the authorities even, just the system. So um, anyway, I'm really terribly thrilled that we've had as many people as we've had today apparently about 120 people online it's obviously a subject of great interest and i think we should pursue this and we should probably do a little follow-up once covid's gone away and see how things have fallen fallen out in burma and you know how things have fallen through and what now what will then be working for us all okay so thanks, everybody, and thank you, Prospect Burma, for delivering a wonderful session. Thank you, Peter, for being such a good manager of it. I envy your organization. We manage ourselves, and we're not so good at it. <laughs> so thank you.
Thank you. We envy yours to the website addresses will come up for both organizations in just a second. Yeah. I do encourage everybody to look at the one that you're least familiar with and share as much goodwill and bonhomie as possible. Thank you very much, please, everybody. If please, we put our please, mute buttons please. on. <laughs> one more, please. Yeah, go on. Note that it's Britain Burma, not British Burma. And that may make a difference when you're punching things through in your Google. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.